and welcome to Booklist. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is multi-talented author G. Willow Wilson. Willow, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. I wanted to talk to you. Um, you you're a graphic novelist. You're a memoirist. Your first novel is out. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to talk to you about about how you manage all that. You have a young child, a young daughter, mm -hmm. and you're going to have another um, child That's right. very <laughs> soon. Um, how, how does that all work? Tell, tell me about, let's start with maybe um, your memoir, Butterfly Mosque. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about, talk about that, the, the genesis of that? Sure. Yeah, The Butterfly Mosque is a, is a book that I started while living in Egypt where I moved uh, straight out of college um, after having um, uh, converted to Islam and, and decided I wasn't going to tell anybody, <laughs> um, but that I wanted to go and live in the Middle East and see what it was like on the ground, um, because previously my exposure had only been through, you know, books and CNN. Um, and while I was there, I would write letters and emails home to uh, friends and to family because I was just experiencing so much and, and um, didn't really realize how naive I was about the world. I didn't do much traveling abroad beforehand. Uh, so, so, you know, moving to Egypt was really kind of being thrown straight in to the, to the amazing diversity of, of human life on this planet. And uh, someone at some point suggested to me that I compile all of these emails and these thoughts that I'd been um, sending home and, and make a kind of a travelogue out of them. Uh, and I said, that sounds like a cool idea. And, uh, and so I started doing that. And as I was kind of cycling through this stuff and, and putting it together, it occurred to me that there was a lot more going on than just observations about this uh -huh. new country that I was in. And there were things that um, I wanted to address, especially in that climate. This was 2003, 2004. Um, and the war in Iraq was very new. And you know, 9-11 was a very... Uh, close memory mm -hmm. in the recent past, and uh, and so really, Butterfly Mosque evolved into something much much bigger and much more personal, um, uh, both about my my own life and uh, faith and how that related to m my upbringing and how things were different here versus in the Middle East, um, and also about uh, the ways that the world was changing and that the, and that the Middle East was changing. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me now is to look back at Butterfly Mosque and see it really as um, a, a piece of history because it's, it's really also about what we didn't know at the time were the final years of the Mubarak regime. Mm -hmm. And of course now everything is different. Mm -hmm. So now it's, it's a very different thing for me to, to, to look back at that book than it was uh, when it came out a couple of years ago. And that was a, a, a difficult book to in the end produce or? Yeah, I, I felt like I was really pulling each word from the fibers of my muscles. It was, it, it felt almost physical in that way because it was so personal. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'd never really written something that personal before for public consumption. Uh, you know, I'd been working as a, as a freelance journalist and, and of course I do comics also. Um, so this was a very, very different thing for me and um, and a, a very different experience of, of writing than, than it was in other genres. Mm -hmm. did, did you have um, worry about your family's response to, to what you were what you were saying or, or just mm -hmm. sort of also setting your, putting yourself out there with your feelings and your, because it's a very, I mean, it, it's not only a public book about right. the Middle East, but it's yeah. a very personal book about faith and, and and beliefs and development and yeah yeah no it, that that was a concern and certainly um, you know the book went through many drafts and uh, there were things that I trimmed or, or cut or rearranged um, to to sort of make it so that I was not stepping on anybody's toes uh -huh. was in my life um, because I mean I when I talk to people about Butterfly Mosque I always say that. I, I don't like the word memoir because it sounds like something that you should write after like a long career in the Foreign Service <laughs> when everybody who could possibly be offended is already dead. Right, right, right. <laughs> and you know, in my case, I was very young and um, 
you know, the people that I was talking about were people who were very close to me and, and, and I didn't want to sort of put them under a huge glaring spotlight. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big consideration. Um, and uh, and it, was, it was a challenge to try to, to balance those things, to, to sort of be truthful and say something meaningful and at the same time respect the, the lives of the people I was talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and, your new, and, the, and your new country, in a way. I, uh, right, you, you know, yeah, that, yeah. That whole region. Yeah. It must have been just, because it was so close to 9-11, a, a really um, a kind of unbelievable place to find yourself or to take yourself yeah. actually yeah. Um, and th and that kind of juxtaposition between what was going on here in versus the United there. States yes versus there it was it was um, you know I was I was in I was in college at Boston University on 9-11 um, and Boston was in a serious uproar because of course one of the planes Right. flew out of Logan Airport and so people were absolutely terrified that there were still terrorists in the city, that they were going to close down the ports, that nobody was going to be able to leave or contact their families. Um, and that is, you know, a, a, a seminal moment for me. I was, I was 18 at the time. Um, and, you know, it, it, it shaped certainly my whole generation, but it, it felt particularly acute for, um, you know, people who were coming of age and also very close physically to the right. events that were occurring. Uh, and so, you know, I tell people, I was, I was interested in Islam at that point, and I, I might have actually considered, uh, you know, adopting the religion that year, except for that event made uh -huh. me sort of really take a huge step back and, right. and reassess and do a lot more research before I became convinced that, that this was actually an abomination and that it was in no way endorsed um, you know, by anything within the religion. So mm -hmm. it, it, um, it was a couple of years before I sort of circled back mm -hmm. um, to, to considering faith in that way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, being in the Middle East um, at that time did sort of feel in some level like, like a betrayal like I shouldn't be there, like it was mm -hmm. unpatriotic. Um, and I at the time there was no reverse pressure. You know, th there was, oh. because people in the Middle East are so, in, in many countries, used to living under autocratic regimes, they don't lump people with their governments mm -hmm. the same way that we tend to, being in a democracy. Uh -huh. um, oh, that's and an so interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I, so I never felt really when I was in Egypt, any kind of personal anti-Americanism directed against me or that the people that uh, I was meeting were holding me personally responsible mm -hmm. for what was unfolding in Iraq or Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, so coming back here to the U.S. Was, was quite a shock to see that in many ways the wounds that were there when I left had not healed, they'd festered, they'd gotten worse. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was that was very shocking to me. And and w was some of that then directed at you? Yes, not in egregious ways. Uh -huh. um, I you know I didn't really even have a word for it until somebody who works in the therapeutic psychological sciences mm -hmm. <laughs> to told me that there's this term for the subtle things that people will do to kind of poke at you almost unconsciously called microaggression. And I said, yes, that's it. Oh, that's oh, what that's it is. That's a very nice word. Um, you know, so it's not, you know, people coming up to you and telling you to, to you're a traitor or to get right. out of here. It's these kind of subtle digs that come up everywhere, you uh -huh. know, in television series that ostensibly have nothing to do with religion or with the Middle East or with politics. You'll hear some crack about you know, Arabs or, or falafel or terrorists or uh -huh. something like that, or, or um, you know, in conversation, people will give you these sort of half-conscious loyalty tests to see what it, what's your opinion about this issue, this issue, this issue. Um, so it's it's low level, uh -huh. but but pretty constant. Sort of almost yeah. like white noise. Like white noise. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's a strange thing to kind of navigate around because. You know, it's it's not people being their best selves, mm -hmm. and and you can see that there's hurt there, and so you don't, you don't want to judge it too harshly, and yet at the same time, you know, it hurts. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> yes, it, uh, and then how do you deal then with ha having a daughter mm -hmm. who is going who is facing or 
or going to face, presumably, that microaggression. It made me tremendously angry at first. I mean, I think when my daughter was born, um, you know, I kind of overnight went into this, this kind of zone where I started thinking about things in a very different way because I felt like now that, you know, my kids are here, these things were supposed to be fixed. Mm -hmm. You know, we were supposed to have made progress. And, and you know, these were issues that I was writing about and working on and, and, uh, and to see that there was so much more to do. Mm -hmm. And yet now it was being passed on to a new generation was very, very frustrating. Um, and yet at the same time, it, it, it gave me some of the most wonderful, creative, kicks in the rear that I think I've ever had. And, and Aleph the Unseen, which, mm -hmm. is, which is my new novel, was very much a product of that. Um, wanting to go new places, want, wanting to use uh, you know, different media to talk about new things, uh, wanting pr to present a different side of, of the world than the one that we see so often on television. Um, so on a creative level, it's been in a weird way tremendously valuable because mm -hmm. it's pushed me to places that I don't think I would have gone otherwise. But certainly as a mother, um, you know, it's, it's sort of my great fear and what I bite my nails about is, is that this, this conflict is going to be at least two generations long. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a serious thing yes. <laughs> when kids yes. come into the picture. It, it is, it is. And it, it takes you out of yourself in a way that um, doesn't happen in many other areas yeah. Of, yeah. Of because you're responsible and you want your children to sure. grow up in a peaceful, yeah. Um, yeah. happy way yeah. and world. Do you handle all of these issues, um, uh, religion and faith and the Middle East and the Arab Spring, differently in your comics? I mean, did, did, did they play a part in your comics as they do so much in Aleph the Unseen? Uh, yes and no. I would say less so. Uh, comics are a very interesting medium because a lot of the time, as a writer, you're playing with somebody else's toys. Mm. Um, they're characters that have been around for a long time. In the cases of the really iconic ones like Superman and Batman, it could be upwards of 100 years. Right. Um, and uh, so you're really dealing not with your own work, but with a legacy. And that is what is very interesting uh, about writing comics, is, is that sort of drive that every writer has to want to tell new stories, but at the same time having to be sensible of the tremendous background that this character has that uh, existed long before you came on the scene. So it feels more like stewardship in a lot of cases. Oh. Sometimes you are working purely on your own stuff. Uh, uh, Air, which was an Eisner Award nominated series that I did for Vertigo, was creator owned and so it was all from my brain and the brain of M.K. Perker, the wonderful Turkish artist who worked on it. Um, but more often you are working with uh, properties that have sort of been in circulation for a long time. And, um, and it's, it's tricky because those characters have a fan base that is often more educated about them than you are sitting down to write the thing. And so it's, uh, it's always interesting to play, in this case, Thursday morning quarterback yeah. because <laughs> Wednesday is the day that <laughs> comics typically come out. Um, and, uh, and hear from the, from the fans, oh, you missed this, or you did this wrong, or this actually happened in this universe, not in this universe. Right, or right. Oh, you forgot he did this. Right, you yeah, know, yeah. In that like, lifetime. You're like, you're right, I, I did, I did not know that. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a totally different experience and, and, uh, and very interesting. And does that come from, were you always a fan of comics? I was. You know, funnily enough, the first comic book I ever read was this sort of strange anti-smoking booklet that we got in health class when I was probably 10 years old um, about a, uh, and it was, it was in comic book form, uh -huh. about a high school athlete who'd taken up smoking and was on the way to ruining his athletic career because he was poisoning his lungs. And so Storm and Wolverine of the X-Men who are, you've probably seen the movie, uh, uh, a team of, of mutant superheroes right. in the Marvel Universe, show up to kind of set him straight. And um, <laughs> I never took up smoking, so you know, on some level it must have resonated. <laughs> but really what was interesting to me were the characters. And I said, wow, you know, they wear these great costumes and they have these awesome powers. And, and, uh, and so that was, that was sort of my entry point. And I got really into 
the X-Men for a while as a sort of a preteen and then as a teenager. Um, Vertigo Comics, which does a lot of the more literary uh -huh. uh, stuff, was just coming into existence. And so I got to see the early works of uh, Neil Gaiman and Grant Morrison and Peter Milligan. So they were first coming out. Mm -hmm. And that had a tremendous impact on me creatively. Did you ever think about doing The Butterfly Mosque as a as as a comic a la Persepolis or oh wow or Aya yeah you know it's uh it it never really occurred to me for that particular book I think it would have been very very different and uh, maybe in some ways better if it, if it had been done as, as a graphic novel but it, it certainly would have changed the scope of the book right uh, yeah I was j I was just thinking about how, well I was thinking about how powerful a book like Persepolis Absolutely. is, yeah. um, and and taking your story uh, told in the Butterfly Mosque and and putting it that way, uh, adapting it mm -hmm. to that medium uh, how would have been so interesting. It would have been. It would have been a totally different yes. set of challenges. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and and are you someone who w you must be someone who welcomes challenges. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to, <laughs> but yeah, I do, I do. I never bite off less than I can chew, it seems. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. So your new, your novel, Aleph the Unseen, is, uh, you describe, the, the first time we met was at a dinner at the um, American Library Association, yeah. and you described it in just this wonderful phrase as like computer, something like, and I know I'm getting this wrong, so correct me, but something like, um, computer hacking meets um, uh, the Arabian Nights, or, or you put mm -hmm. it in a much better way, but that was the idea mm -hmm. of, of it. Would, would you talk about the book? It's such a wonderful, it's such a, it, it's a book that just touches on so many different aspects that it's, it's very hard to sort of have a um, a through line when you're talking about it because you want to say, oh, and it was written during the Arab Spring, so there's you know this hopefulness in it, and then there's this. Yeah. yeah. Over to you, my dear. <laughs> um, it was you know Aleph. I, I started working on it pretty much the second Butterfly Mosque went to press, and I um. said, you know, there was there was so much um, more that I wanted to say. I was I was pregnant with my daughter, my first daughter. Um, and, I, you know, I could tell that for years there'd been this momentum building digitally in the Middle East because the internet had just given unprecedented access to the world, to this, you know, group of young upcoming right. Arab activists um, who were living otherwise in, in states that were very repressive of information and who controlled the media, television, radio. Um, and it's, it's very hard to censor the internet. You can do it, but it's tough. And I had met so many amazing people who were synthesizing this new technology uh, with the traditions and the cultures that they'd come from in totally new ways. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to talk about that in the Butterfly Mosque, but at the time, uh, social media was a very hard sell. I mean, people sort of thought of, of Generation Y globally mm -hmm. as a generation of slackers. Mm -hmm. And texting is, and, and Twitter and all this stuff is just one big distraction. And, um, and I wanted to show that that was not the case and that there were very important things that were happening in conversations. Um, and also to talk about some of the more uh, mystical, uh, irrational, transcendent things uh, that are part of, of the culture of the Middle East that I didn't really get a chance to talk about. And Aleph just kind of came tumbling out. Um, you know, people ask, well, you know, wh what was the moment or what was the thing that happened? And, and I really can't point to one specific thing. It was almost like, you know, Athena leaping out of the head of Zeus or something. It, it, just, it just came out in a torrent. Um, and it's a, it's a book about a young a uh, disenfranchised hacker in an unnamed Middle Eastern emirate who falls in love with the wrong girl and uh, has to go on the run from a very shadowy state security agency that seems to have a lot more going for it than just technology. The hand. The hand, yes, the hand, who, who, who seems to have uh, powers of manipulation that extend far beyond the internet and, and of whom Aleph and his cadre of, of malcontents are, are extremely afraid. 
Um, and so he kind of goes underground with uh, the Islamist girl next door and a book that may or may not be fake and some genies. And so it's very much um, an urban adventure story, but there's, there's a lot of uh, discussion of the role of technology and of religion and of the unseen kind of woven through it such that it, it's, uh, you know, has some un unabashedly fantasy elements. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking for libraries, it would be very difficult to know where to, s where to shelve this. To d is it shelved <laughs> with, uh, you know, we yeah. have that unfortunate yeah. habit of dividing books up into different genres, which I always have a little bit of a problem with. Yeah. So yeah. does this belong in the, the mainstream literature section or do we put it with fantasy? fantasy. And you know, it's, it's funny. I, I get that question a lot. And I, so, and I always think that it's, it's strange that we still have to ask that question when we've had such wonderful trans-genre right. writers. Uh, you know, I, Neil Gaiman is a good one. China Mieville right. is another one. Neil Stevenson. And even going back to the works of Umberto Eco, mm -hmm. you know, who writes very literary, dense, wonderful books, mm -hmm. but that have unabashedly pop cultural fantasy elements right. kind of woven right. through them. Or mystery elements or in mystery the case elements. of Name of the Rose. In the case, right, yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, uh, Foucault's Pendulum, which is, which is his um, big thick sequel to, to I mean, uh -huh. not, it's not a sequel, but the, the book that he wrote after Name of the Rose is one of my absolute favorite books. Mm -hmm. And I think Aleph owes something to it because even though it was written, I think, in the, in the 80s when computing was very new, right. the word processor, which was the apogee of technology at the time, plays a very big yeah. role in the book. And so, um, you know, I, I, I never really sat down and thought, well, what genre is this? Because I thought there's so much great genre bending stuff coming right. out now. Right. That, uh, you know, maybe we've sort of moved beyond those categorizations. Um, so I don't know if I would put it with the mainstream literature or on, it, or on its own you know, fantasy shelf with, with sort of the sword and sorcery stuff. It, it could really go in either one. I, I call that whole um, that whole group of books that we're ta that we're talking about and and yours included. I'd like to think of them as elastic realism. That's a great term. I'm going to start using that. Please do. <laughs> I, I I could never. I mentioned it on Morning Edition one time that I was just looking for a word, a phrase that would describe these books that aren't really magical realism, mm -hmm. because I think that that's not a very, it's not an easy concept to understand. But elastic right. realism is just so obvious. You kind of think about. I think about a rubber band that stretching, stretching, <laughs> and what you're doing is stretching, yeah. is stretching realism. That's a great way of putting it. I like that a lot. Oh, and good. in fact, I, I did a top 10 book list for a feature, uh, an internet feature in the UK, where you're supposed to sort of pick a, a genre or, a, or a, you know, a topic that you like and, and talk about 10 books that, that discuss mm -hmm. this. And um, I, w I, I titled it Very Real Magical Realism uh -huh. because I, was, I, you know, I yes. wanted a word for exactly what you're right. talking about. And I realized there really wasn't a term for it, but there were all of these books that sort of fit in that mm -hmm. category or the under that umbrella. Right. And um, and and it's it's true we don't really have a word for it, but elastic realism is is great. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, and and somebody else who I think does that so well is Kelly Link. Mm -hmm. do you, her book. Do you know the name her? is familiar, but she, I've never read um, anything of hers. Uh, her books are just. Um, uh, they're, they're short stories. She has not done a novel yet, and they're exact. I think that you would love them. I'll have to actually. Look that up. You'll yeah. have to look them up because they would be great. Um, they're just fabulous. Um, so, with Alice, you and you wanted to do it as a narrative and not as a comic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought um, in in this case, there was so much going on that, that, that really needed prose, mm -hmm. I thought. Um, you know, comics are, are really, in many ways, a broadsword, and I kind of wanted a scalpel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that meant prose. So mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, when I was thinking about this, and I often have this process in my head before I sit down to write, what kind of book is this? Um, you know, it, should this be a graphic novel? Mm -hmm. Pictures are always kind of in the back of my head as, as an option. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you know what? It's there's too much that goes on off stage in Aleph that would be very difficult to depict 
in a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, it's going to be very comic booky, but it's going to be prose. And so, you know, that's that's something that I've I've heard from a lot of readers is, is that on some level there is a kind of resonance with comic books because of the pacing, yes. because of the tone. Um, so, but, but I thought because the scope was so large and there were so many um, cerebral things that get drawn in uh -huh. that I, I really wanted to use words. I, and when I was thinking about it, I, I, I too couldn't, I couldn't quite imagine that a comic or a graphic novel would get and maybe I'm maybe I'm not being fair to graphic novels <laughs> at this point, but I, but I couldn't I, I, I mean the co the the complexities of it and the backstories, uh, all that was there seemed to me to demand um, a pure language mm -hmm. with with mm -hmm. with the pictures coming out in your mind in your mind yeah I felt the same way I mm -hmm. felt the same way um, you know I think there's there's a lot that you can do particularly with regards to time in comic books that you can't do with mm -hmm. prose. But on the other hand, um, you can kind of dig a little bit deeper with prose because you don't have the same constraints of number of panels on a page right. and cluttering up the artwork with unnecessary words. Um, and those are things that you have to take into account when you're writing a graphic novel. Do you think this is a hopeful book? It is, it is. You know, I tried not to be too gung-ho about the idea of revolution. Of course, uh, you know, I, I finished it just as the Arab Spring was kicking off, mm -hmm. and um, I had no idea when I was writing it that what was going to happen in the Middle East would be so spectacular mm -hmm. or so widespread. Um, but I knew, you know, when I, was, when I was plotting the book, I said, you know, if a revolution like this were to happen, I have to consider that you know, like the French Revolution, like all revolutions, there's 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 going to be a mess, mm -hmm. and that um, a mob, even a mob driven by the highest ideals, is going to be prone to violence, mm -hmm. and is going to be prone to some of the worst excesses of human nature because that just seems to be part of us. You know, when we get together in crowds right. without law, um, there's some there are things that that happen that are unfortunate um, and tragic and unnecessary and so I tried to have that leveraging element to have that element saying you know like th th this is not a wholly wonderful thing that is happening there's mm -hmm. chaos you know uh, Dina who's one of the main characters of the book almost gets in serious trouble and and um, likewise one of the aristocratic characters you, you know uh, against whose class this revolution right. is taking place uh, gets into a lot of trouble, so I didn't, you know, I didn't want to shrink from that, mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad I didn't because I think, you know, now that 18 months have passed since since sort of the meat of the Arab Spring, yes. we're seeing a lot of that come to light. A lot right. of like sort of the worst urges of of large groups of people who are angry, um, and uh, and and so you know, I I leave it on a hopeful but chaotic note, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, you know, it's it's unclear how this is going to play out at the end of Aleph, uh, but what is clear is that things have been done that cannot be undone, and and that the people who wa were willing to make those sacrifices did so, mm -hmm. and so that there, you know, the ingredients for a better society are there. But who knows what is going to happen in the future? Yeah. Well, Willow, I know that I join many, many, many readers um, in looking with uh, great anticipation to your next book. And well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It was my pleasure. Thank you.